All right, I think we should start. All right, so thank you for coming here uh, Saturday morning. Uh, so this talk is about MySQL, but it's also a talk about the security. Uh, this is about securing uh, customer data, especially uh, health uh, customer data. So my name is uh, Alex. I've been working with MySQL since uh, the 2006. I joined MySQL AB, a company behind MySQL in 2006, as a consultant, professional services. And uh, as you all probably know, MySQL has been acquired. That's a history now. Uh, has been acquired by Sun Microsystems. Sun Microsystems has been acquired by Oracle. So I worked for Oracle for a while, then I worked at Percona for six years. Uh, anyone not familiar with uh, Percona? Uh, so that's a um, consulting company also. Percona do uh, MySQL, open source version of MySQL, as well, a fork of MySQL. Uh, so re I recently joined uh, Virtual Health, that's a medical startup company. Uh, and we do uh, software as a service for insurance companies. So when I joined Virtual Health, I have been constantly learning uh, lots of things about uh, healthcare, about HIPAA, about protecting customer data. Uh, and uh, it all comes with, for me, uh, and my responsibility is to protect customer data in MySQL. So what kind of requirements do we have? Uh, this is very common, right? So we have encryption, and encryption we have encryption for data in flight, that's a communication between client and MySQL. We have encryption for data at rest, that's basically encrypting bytes on disk. We also have this requirement for audit trail, so we need to log every action that anyone is doing with MySQL. Uh, finally, we'll need to, this is something, there are two other topics that I will be discussing today. First is user authentication. We need to make it secure, but also we'll need to give our internal users uh, an access to MySQL without compromising the data. And this is something that is uh, actually common in uh, healthcare industry. Uh, it is called, in healthcare, it's called uh, de-identification. It's basically anonymization of the uh, customer record. So the reason for that is that if we want to give our developers or researchers or anyone else an access to the data, we definitely don't want to give them the raw data, the customer data. At the same time, we need to give them uh, the data that are very close to the real production data. So that's why we have the process of de-identifying uh, the customer data. So let's start with uh, uh, just very common topics, and then we will uh, move forward to more advanced stuff. So first of all is data in flight encryption. So this is SS SSL or TLS. Uh, the good news is that in MySQL starting with the 5.7, uh, the SSL TLS is used by default. It is enabled unless you specifically disable that. So in the previous versions, you have to generate keys and uh, you have to copy the keys from server to the client. Uh, so basically you will need to, uh, you had to exchange the keys. Now it is working similar to HTTPS protocol. It, uh, when MySQL starts, it will generate the server key. Uh, and then a client will connect and communicate the uh, protocol uh, so that uh, all the connection will be uh, SSL TLS. Let me ask you first, uh, for the people in this room, who uses 
MySQL 5.7. All right, who don't use any MySQL at all? Or never used? Okay, one person. Two, okay. What do you guys use? Cool. Okay, cool. Um, now, who is using, for those who use MySQL, who is using MySQL 8? All right, cool, in production, nice. So who is using older versions, MySQL 5.1? No, 5.5, 5.1. 5.5.6, 5.5, 5.1, 4.0, 4.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0, 5.0
So this is synchronous replication. And uh, everything you write to node one will be replicated to node two and node three. So this is what we want to protect with uh, SSL or TLS. Another part of this is a so-called join. So if you provision the cluster initially and you, or you add a node, you will connect a blank server, a server which have MySQL installed but no data. And then it will copy, it will automatically copy data from another node. So this is called SST, the full synchronization. This is stuff that we also want to protect when it will be copying. So the good news is that there, there is a single variable that will enable encryption for all communication in cluster. Uh, it's called PXC encrypt cluster traffic. Uh, so we will need to also copy the keys. The reason for that is that MySQL 5.7 plus by default will generate the keys. But it will generate it separately on all three nodes. For this thing to work, we will need to have the keys to be the same. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to take one node, take those generated keys, and copy it over to all three nodes. And then put this PXE encrypt traffic and restart all nodes. So this is how we protect communications uh, in uh, MySQL. Any questions? Yes. This is Percona ExtraDB cluster, which is based on Galera cluster. This is an open source product. Um, and um, this is just another uh, protocol. So if you're familiar with the replication, this is different type of replication. And there are another implementations of this uh, Galera cluster based on MariaDB distribution. You, you're talking about Aurora, Aurora? I, right, yeah. Y yes, yes, uh, it is, it is. I can talk about that later on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, this is, this is a good question. So uh, from MySQL 5.7 and on perspective, we, uh, so what I'm talking about, let's, let's talk about this one, right? So this is, the, uh, this is the PM keys, right? So this is the server key, uh, certificate authority, and server cert. So this is for server communication. So we will copy those keys on all three nodes. For master-slave, we don't uh, even have to do this. We can, it is good to, to copy all the keys, but we can, uh, uh, we can uh, just do the master SSL equals one. What it will not do, it will not verify the keys. I can talk about that later on in more detail. So the next topic is uh, data at rest encryption. So what data at rest encryption is, uh, how we... Um, how we protect bytes written to disk. And uh, there are three options available. And this is not uh, only for uh, MySQL, it's just for databases in general. So we can do a full disk encryption and uh, can use the LUX or anything else. We can use what is called transparent database encryption or TDE. And then finally, we can identify all the fields that needs to be encrypted and encrypt those fields. This is what I call a field level encryption. So for full disk encryption, uh, there are a couple of blog posts that outline how to use LUX with MySQL, how to uh, open and close uh, the disks, the devices. So what, um, what that essentially is, 
you will have a secure device on dev, and then MySQL will be running on top of that. In AWS, you can use uh, EBS with a custom key. When you create EBS volume, you can specify a custom key for the encryption. And uh, if you use shared storage, you can also do uh, potentially do encryption there. Now, the downside of the encryption is that it will only protect the physical disk. The problem with that is that when the server is running, then uh, it's not encrypted. So it only protects from someone janking the disk out of the server. Uh, so in the you know, modern world with the cloud, it may be not what we're looking for. Uh, if the requirement is encrypting data on disk, that may be a good checkpoint for your requirements, but in reality, it may not be what you're looking for. So again, in, if MySQL is running, then all data files in MySQL are not encrypted. So anyone who has an access to the server, who has a MySQL level access or root access, can copy the files, start MySQL on those files, and that's it. So another option is transparent database encryption. So MySQL implemented it this way. We have a master key. It will create MySQL by itself, will create a master key, and will store it. Then it will use the master key to encrypt another key, a table space key. This is the key will be used to encrypt all the tables. So that implementation actually allowed to easily rotate the key because we are rotating only the master key. So what MySQL actually stores? So when we write something into a table, do insert, how many times MySQL will actually save it on disk? Well, you may say one because it will just need to write to one table, but this is not true. MySQL has a lots of lots of places where it will store the data. MySQL is um, the transactional system with a multi-versioning and durability. So MySQL will need to store the copy of the data in multiple places and multiple times. Uh, MySQL has the concept of storage engine, and InnoDB is the storage engine here. So when we insert something into a table, it will save it in the table space, which is actually the file where the table reside. It will also use the redo logs, undo logs. This is for uh, transactional consistency and for recovery purposes. And what we can do is we can encrypt those. So we can encrypt InnoDB files. This is available in uh, MySQL uh, version uh, in community version 5.7, starting 5.7. In addition to that, we have binary logs. So binary logs are used for replication. Uh, during the replication process, everything that uh, changes the data will be stored, will be flushed into the binary logs. And then these binary logs will be shipped to the replication server, and um, basically they will be uh, all the transactions will be re-executed. So every time you write something, it will also be stored in binary logs. Encryption for the binary logs and relay logs. Relay logs are on the slave. It's the same thing on the slave. Uh, available in MySQL eight and uh, starting with the server 5.7 as well. And finally, there are, can be lots of operations that require creating temporary tables. Uh, and uh, I'm also talking about things that MySQL will need to satisfy to execute the queries. It's not only about uh, explicitly creating temporary tables, but MySQL for slow queries may need to create temporary tables. So this thing can also can also needs to be or should be encrypted. Uh, so this is available in Percona Server 5, 7, and 8. 
so those are the links that describe uh, the encryption mechanism in more details. So now, what I wanted to do is I want to test. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is another good point. Um, swap is potentially, uh, potentially concerning. Uh, this is something that MySQL has no control over and cannot encrypt. So this is something that we may have to uh, encrypt on the file system level or not encrypt at all or simply disable swap. So we run servers with swap disabled on MySQL servers. It's just disabled. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, that may or may not fit your uh, purposes. But swap is, is a, a good question. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to simulate, I wanted to test how MySQL, how and where physically, in which files MySQL store the data. So I created this random string. Let's say this is my social security number, although it doesn't look like it. Um, but I created this random string. I created a new table, and I inserted uh, this random string into uh, this new table. And then I also did update, because during the update, MySQL will store some additional information in additional files. So now, I simply do grep in the MySQL data directory. And uh, here is the files. So this is where this random string that I have created appears. So this appears in the log file. This is redo log for uh, recovery purposes. It is in uh, the binary log. Uh, this is used for replication. It is in IBD file. A dot IBD file is where the table uh, data is. And uh, it is in double write file. And double write is basically a protection for MySQL. MySQL for every write, it will first write to this area called double write on disk to make sure that the write will be uh, completed successfully. And only then it will write to the table. So we can find our, so this is basically where MySQL writes. It writes in four places or even more. TMP uh, is not involved here. So how do we protect that and how do we enable the transparent database encryption so uh, this data will not be stored unencrypted on disk? We need to add all the, of those. So there are lots of configuration variables, but we'll need to add all of that in uh, MySQL and restart. So a couple things to point out here. The first is the location of the keyring file. This is our uh, uh, the master file, and we can uh, store it on the same server, which is not secure, or we can store it somewhere else, somewhere else, and I will talk about that. Another thing uh, here is that we are forcing encrypting the tables. Uh, because the encryption works the way that we, when you create a table, normally when you create a table, you need to pass a parameter, encrypt equals Y, encrypt equals yes. But I don't want that. I want every table to be encrypted by default. So this is why I put this parameter in, uh, in the db encrypt tables equals force, so that uh, when the tables will be created, it will be created encrypted. So now let's uh, repeat the test. So I do the same thing. I dropped my old table. I restarted my SQL. I created a new table, and then this encrypted equal yes is uh, actually commented out because I don't need to put it in. It will be encrypted by default. And let's see, nothing. So the grab 
will show nothing. That means that the, the, the data, this random string has been encrypted. All right. Uh, any questions about data? Uh, so let me finish with this. So the, another thing that we'll need to do for data at rest encryption is rotate the keys. If the key is compromised or if you just want to rotate it regularly, you can do that very easy. Now this statement, alter table, uh, no, alter instance, rotate in a master key does not touch the actual table. It will not decrypt and re-encrypt the actual tables. It will only change the master key. So it will change the master key, and with the master key, it will re-encrypt the table space keys. So this is our key rotation. When we, uh, when we change the, um, uh, it when it will re-encrypt the table space keys, the, um, the key will be rotated. But it will not uh, touch the actual tables. Another thing is that what is not good in uh, this setup is that the key is actually stored in a setup that I just showed. The key is actually stored on the server. What we can do is we can use this HashiCorp vault to store the key. Then the key will not be stored on the server. Uh, and it will be stored in uh, HashCorp. Uh, Percona has the plugin for that, and uh, you can use that to store the key. Any questions about TD? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. We will need to. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can do. You can do it even easier than uh, dumping and restore. You can do all the table encrypt equal y. Yes, and then I will re-encrypt. It will start encrypting those tables, but it will have to rebuild this table now. So it will not be uh, very fast, but yes. Right, this is a very good question. This is transparent database encryption. So you don't need to do anything with that. So you don't need to configure your client. And this is also, this is a good question uh, because this is very easy to use, but this is also a downside of the transparent database encryption. So what that means is that if I have MySQL root password, I can easily do MySQL dump and copy everything from MySQL. Now, what if I have a root access and I don't have a password? Well, if I can restart MySQL, then I can copy the data because I can put this option in my.cnf called skip grand table, restart MySQL, and the whole permission thing, ECL, will be disabled. So I can just do connect to MySQL locally uh, and do MySQL dump. If I cannot restart MySQL server, maybe because we mount, and this is a, a good option that we can mount the keyring file outside. So here in my example, I use the mount point. So we can create something, some script, that will start MySQL and unmount 
Because when MySQL is started, then it doesn't need this. It's all in memory. So we can unmount this uh, partition so the key will not be available. So if I will try to restart the server, it will fail to start because it will not find the keyring uh, file. Uh, so that's, um, so yeah, this is transparent to the application, to the users, so you don't need to do anything when you select the data, but this is also a bit of downside, right? Because that will, uh, the data is not encrypted in memory. Yes. Uh, exactly, you can see the data. O also, I can attach some uh, GDB uh, debugger to MySQL and try to find uh, so some data. So it's it's not perfect. It is better than, it's a level up from the uh, disk encryption. It is better than disk encryption in my mind, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect. So what are other options? So we can do uh, also do data at rest encryption uh, with the field level encryption. So what is field level encryption? So anyone uh, actually using MySQL with uh, PII or data that needs to be protected? Uh, cool. So do you guys have a list of all PII information? Anyone who have it? So if you have a list of all your PII information, then it is possible to implement the application level, field level encryption. The advantages of doing that is that we don't need to worry about MySQL files being encrypted on disk. Uh, so the idea here is very simple. The application knows the fields that needs to be encrypted. Maybe those fields are stored in a table or in a configuration file or somewhere else. Uh, and then uh, the application itself will encrypt those fields before placing it into MySQL. So that sounds good from the security perspective. However, it can be very challenging uh, from the application perspective and uh, writing code. Um, there are a number of issues here. The first issue, if, if you're doing it purely in application, then the issue will be how we do a rotation, the key rotation. We will need to uh, do either do the same thing that MySQL has implemented with the two keys, master key, uh, or we will need to decrypt and re-encrypt with a different key. We need to store keys somewhere. So those challenges can be solved with a a HashiCorp vault, and the application can actually use something like encryption as a service or API. So the application will contact vault and ask it to encrypt the data. But then it will work very well for things like social security numbers, which are unique. But it may not work very well for things like first name and last name. Why is that? Because uh, the application may actually need to search and order by first name and last name. If those are encrypted, and MySQL has no idea about what is in there exactly, then to sort that, we'll need to retrieve everything, put it into the application, and then sort it in the application. Or another thing that we will have to do is to create another field with the order information and update this field regularly. So the field level encryption may be more secure, but it's not very easy to work with uh, in uh, the application. Yes? Uh, correct, we don't have any, well, uh, I mean, in MySQL, we don't have the implementation of the field level encryption. Uh, 
we can do that in the application, but we don't have that. Uh, MySQL has the functions called IS encrypt and IS decrypt. I would definitely not using it. <laughs> the reason for that is not because they are not secure, but because it's so hard to work with uh, this level of encryption. If you're doing that, then we'll need to again store the keys. We will need to, uh, when we do a select, we'll need to use the functions to decrypt those and stuff like that. Also, we'll need to pass the key to MySQL somehow. And this, uh, that will not be secure. All right, so uh, who are using, actually who are using uh, disk encryption in MySQL? Anyone using uh, TDE? Using transparent database encryption in MySQL, anyone? No? Using disk encryption? Okay. Using field encryption? Cool, all right. All right. Any other questions? Before we'll go further. All right, very good. So um, there are three other topics left. I will quickly talk about audit log. So audit log uh, is um, a feature of Percona server and also MySQL Enterprise. Uh, in uh, Percona server, you can uh, very easily enable the audit log plugin. And with the audit log plugin, you will have uh, all the queries recorded in a file. So this is a little bit different to general log. The general log is hard to work with, and also general log has a little bit more overhead. Uh, also, general log does not provide all the information needed. So what, would, what do we need for audit log? We need a time, we need who did, and uh, we need to know what this person did. So everything, uh, all of that will be recorded in uh, audit log when we will enable it. So here's the link how to enable uh, the audit log. I don't want to spend too much time on this topic because it's very easy and straightforward. So the next topic is about user authentication. To me that is interesting and when I started with uh, virtual health we have this uh, we have this issue, we have this challenge. How do we provide our internal users uh, an access to MySQL database and still protect our data. So who needs database access? Uh, developers, uh, potentially. Um, maybe not all of them. Uh, support team definitely need an access to the real data to be able to uh, see what's going on. Um, maybe business analysts. Uh, business analysts usually don't need to see the protected uh, information, PHI information, but they still need to have an access to uh, MySQL potentially. And there are a couple challenges here. The first challenge is security, obviously. Right? We need to provide them access uh, securely. The second is performance impact. Well, if you're a DBA or has been working as a DBA, you know how a query, a single select query can affect the performance of the server. So we need to make sure that our business analysts will not create an SQL query that will take down MySQL server. Uh, so here's how we can do this. What are the options? So we can use shared accounts for all of them. And just don't. It's a big no. Uh, I don't know if you, anyone is using shared accounts, and uh, I've seen people using shared accounts, but this is bad. This is bad because we cannot distinguish the action from user one to actions of user two, right? This is basically anonymous account. This is easy to do, but this is not what we want to do. The second thing is, the second option is we can create 
30 or hundred or thousands of MySQL accounts on all MySQL servers. At Virtual Health, we are actually creating an infrastructure per customer. Uh, so that means that we have a lots of lots of MySQL servers. This is exactly the thing I want to avoid. I don't want to add and manage and the deal with the passwords and password rotations with the hundreds of MySQL users on hundreds of MySQL servers. So this is not easy to manage. Finally, we can do LDAP authentication on MySQL server. MySQL server, Percona server, uh, MySQL Enterprise, uh, supp uh, MariaDB support the LDAP authentication. But the problem is that it will require a PAM. It is dependent upon Linux configuration. So if I want to enable that, I will have to reconfigure hundreds of servers. So this is not easy. And then finally, we can use the HashiCorp Vault to create users dyna dynamically. This is a great option, but there is an implementation of that called MySQL Bastion that's very interesting. But the downside of that is for users, it's very inconvenient to work with. They will first need to get to request a new user credentials and then use these user credentials to log into MySQL. It's very good from the security standpoint, but it's very inconvenient for the users. So what I want to do is I have those hundreds of servers and I want to allow users magically to those hundreds of servers without changing much. What should I do? Well, maybe we can use a proxy. So the good news is that we have this open source product called ProxySQL, which is men in the middle. ProxySQL is similar to HAProxy, but HAProxy just do a TCP level connection and balancing, and ProxySQL actually emulates MySQL protocol. So it talks MySQL protocol, and the user will connect to ProxySQL as if it is MySQL. And then ProxySQL will route the connection to MySQL server. So this is the architecture that we can implement. We have a MySQL server host. It can be a physical server or it can be EC2 instance or anything. On top of the MySQL, we'll set up ProxySQL. ProxySQL will connect to MySQL locally. We don't even need SSL here. But then ProxySQL will provide our uh, users an SSL encrypted endpoint connection. And our users can connect using PHP Madmin, can use the 